always remember the story of the, the old convent in San Francisco that was the early hospice. And literally, when people died, they had to be carried out. There was no elevator. So it was down the stairs, over the shoulder, two people walking people out when they died. If you had a longtime partner who was dying, the hospital could, in fact, keep you out of that person's room. We have so many firsts, and it, it was time to do something. I think Seattle, it was well known by then. People were dying. There was work to be done. Daily Boucher was kind of an alchemical magic that happened when the community of Seattle pulled together the wisdom and resources and the creativity and wackiness of its communities. All these communities came together around Bailey Boucher. I've always had a incredible commitment to serving folks who need health care, who need resources, who aren't served by our mainstream systems. I worked at the Pike Market Community Clinic with Chris Hurley, who was the first administrator of Bailey Boucher House. And in our last, in my last few years there in the mid-80s, we began to see increasing numbers of folks living with HIV and AIDS. The clinic became a place just by circumstance and good fortune in many ways, uh, a place because of a receptionist that was at the clinic, became a place, early place for people with AIDS to show up. There were no options at the time in Seattle or any urban area. Home health agencies were not very anxious to take care of these people. Hospice really hadn't grown very much at the time. Many people in the gay community primarily were concerned that uh, with an increasing number of cases that there would be a lot of support needed for people who were dying of AIDS. The disease itself was, was impacting the community. I mean, the numbers were growing. Um, I believe it's how Betsy got involved initially in King County. Um, there was some wonderful, maybe it was Robert Wood Johnson funding to assess the needs of people with HIV AIDS in King County. We sat down together for nine months. We met in the cafeteria of Swedish. And out of that community-wide planning process came a series of recommendations that included building a 35-bed skilled nursing facility and day health program for folks with HIV in our community. And so AIDS Housing of Washington was founded in May of 88 to build what became Bailey Boucher House. When AIDS Housing of Washington came into existence, AIDS was in its infancy. People didn't even necessarily really understand what caused AIDS, you know, and was it a gay disease, and was it just the bathhouses in San Francisco, and a lot of fear of what it was or how it was transmitted. And you have to remember that it was effectively then incurable, and for a lot of people, a very fast death. Uh, many of us participated at that time in uh, some of the big quilt marches back in Washington, D.C. I remember, you know, holding hands around the White House during uh, the Reagan administration because, you know, President Reagan was just in complete denial about it, if not hostile about the issue. People were so blatantly discriminated against to extreme detriment of themselves and their families to, to, to see how badly things could go in one's life because you had AIDS. One of my first cases was a man in a hospital, a very well-known hospital in New York. Um, I got there about 6.30 p.m. Um, I saw that in front of his room, all three meal trays were untouched. I went into his room and he was lying in his own feces and urine and vomit. Um, and um, no, it was obvious no one had been in the room the whole day. There was a lot of fear even in the medical community among nurses and other people who work in the hospital. So it's a very uncompassionate kind of uh, sterile environment where uh, we were not doing right by these people. 
So this incredible group of people came together as the founding board. Many of them were from the original planning committee. You know, leaders like Shirley Bridge, who has devoted her life to social justice issues. It was so clear to her, Kaz Jones, some of the early board members, I mean, certainly Betsy and Donald and others, that this, this was a social justice issue. It simply was the right thing to do. I think we wanted for those people who were living with AIDS to have the kind of care and compassion that we would have wanted for ourselves and that we wanted for our own friends and family. It's something that we were all facing very directly. So uh, the motivation for many of us was simply to, how do we create a place to die well? You were literally losing board members because they were living with AIDS, and at that time, the average life expectancy in King County was about 18 months. We had board members who died with increasing regularity. At that point, it was a death sentence, and it was a short death sentence. And so for people to say, I'm coming to work on this every day, and I'm coming often when I'm very weak and very ill, and I'm coming with good humor and not with bitterness, was amazing. And of the 10 original people who signed on the Article 6 are no longer living. I can remember people who were opposed to building Bailey Boucher House down in Madison Valley. And they would say things like, it's going to kill restaurants because people who have HIV or AIDS are going to be in those restaurants eating. Some people would express fear that the patients were going to be carrying their laundry over to the laundromat where they did their laundry. The Madison Valley, which was just starting to, to gentrify, there were some folks who came fairly unglued and some fairly heated negotiations on that front. A neighbor right behind us who put out a big banner that said, not in my backyard. And um, I just happened to know this man on the peripheral and it, uh, they, somebody got wind of the fact that I did. So we baked cookies <laughs> and I went up to his house and we had cookies and lemonade on his porch. And I asked him, what his objections were to this. And he said, well, I don't want to look out my window and see naked men. You know, it was just, he was very angry. And part of it came from his own fear of what was going to happen to him. And, and he ended up coming to Bailey. And he ended up being a supporter of Bailey. And it was our day health staff that helped him stay alive. One person actually said that we didn't want overt homosexual behavior in, uh, in our neighborhood. So a bunch of us who are radical fairies actually decided to stage a terrorist shopping spree. The idea was to show the neighborhood what it would be like if there were overt homosexual behavior. So we dressed up in crazy, outrageous clothes and went through the neighborhood shopping and so we spent money at the local stores and we handed out literature about Bailey Boucher and we said um, you know we really hope that this overt homosexual behavior won't hurt your neighborhood so people laughed and it was it was able to kind of turn around some of the tension in the neighborhood and who knows maybe we had an impact on some of the uh, merchants I recall that there was uh, at least one person maybe more who were initially opposed to the project, but eventually became regular volunteers at Bailey Boucher. I thought First Hill was the best place for them. But once I thought that over and researched myself and what I've learned about Bailey, what Bailey really needed was a family. They needed the community to be their family, and the community needed Bailey to be the part of the family. Once we connected, Bailey was in the right place. We knew we weren't finished with challenges in the neighborhood, but we really wanted to really plant our flag. And when people came, we had them write 
messages on these just you know like they were sending something out they wrote names they wrote whatever they wrote and then they stuck them in the construction fence and we had our groundbreaking ceremony and when it was over there was this construction fence over the entire property that was just fluttering just fluttering with these orange streamers with names and messages and and I think that we knew at that moment that there wasn't anything that wasn't going to keep us from being successful with this project. It was if all those messages were like flying up, just blessing the whole place. This was a brand new idea in a lot of ways. There really hadn't been a skilled nursing home focused on AIDS patients, and there were whole issues of reimbursement of how you operated. But if I had understood the complexity of trying to put this project together, I probably would have been too scared to do it. Who would you find who would step forward with a relatively ununderstood disease, with a facility that was just 36 beds, so you don't have a lot of economies of scale. Who was going to do that in that atmosphere? My title was Senior Associate Administrator at Virginia Mason, and I got a call from Betsy Lieberman, who I knew but not, didn't know well. Betsy said, uh, we had a relationship with Sisters of Providence. That has ended. That was the most emotional time I've ever had in my life. Uh, and more emotional than deaths in my family. It was watching that fall apart and knowing that we probably weren't going to be able to open on time and might not open. There might be nobody else that would step forward. It was a daunting proposition because Virginia Mason uh, had never operated a skilled nursing facility before. They were really known at that time more for uh, being the people to whom the upper crust went for care. It was an organization that was pretty conservative and straight-laced, and I should say straight-laced, uh, uh, didn't have any natural connections um, with the gay community. In fact, what we found as we sold the project were some real evidences of latent homophobia in the organization, so that was one of the obstacles that we had to overcome. There was no one who wanted to step up to this task, and Virginia Mason did. Virginia Mason stepped up and agreed to operate Bailey Boucher House without knowing or understanding or even caring about all the pitfalls that were ahead. And in the course of a few weeks, I think it was only three or four weeks from start to finish, they stepped forward, we negotiated a lease, they guaranteed the lease, they promised to cover operational losses, and that was just an extraordinary act of corporate courage. The facility was called the facility for a long time. Sort of an interesting name, but it, they didn't have a name for it. And they were waiting and waiting and waiting for the naming gift, you know, the gift that would be so big that you could name it, name the facility after it, and there was no naming gift. I mean, one of the, m the biggest gifts that came was an anonymous gift, so it just didn't lend itself to a, a ringy name. The name Bailey Boucher House comes from two men, Thatcher Bailey and Frank Boucher. Thatcher lost his partner, Frank Boucher, to uh, AIDS, I think just before he joined the board. And he went out and convinced me and others that we really needed to make a stretch to give to this project. And I ended up giving more money than I'd ever given to anything in my life because Thatcher made the appeal so beautifully and so strongly. Thatcher raised all of this money and AIDS Housing of Washington wanted to name the building after Thatcher. Thatcher initially said no, that would be, that was just, he's a, he's a, modest man and just thought that would be too much about him. And then Donald Chamberlain suggested, well, why not you know, bring Frank into this and, and call it Bailey Boucher, at which point I understood what that could mean and it, it, was, it was touching to me in a, in a very different way. And naming it after a couple, one of whom had died of AIDS, the other who has AIDS and who survived and lived on, ultimately became a perfect thing 
for that facility. I, I can still remember how we all walked up to it and just kind of stared for a moment thinking this was not only a dream, it's really here, it's really happening. We had 5,000 people give to that project when we were developing it and I don't know how many thousand showed up for the opening, but it was an amazing, amazing experience. My daughter was five and my son would have been eight or nine. And I showed it to them and they said, well, dad, the facility is there. What are you doing? What's your role? Well, I'm going to help put the people in the building. And I remember I was bawling there on, on East Madison Street. That was, you know, it really just hit me that that's really what we were about. And all of a sudden, everything, every stereotype, everything was shattered. The minute that Betty Boucher opened up, everything. Because all of a sudden, people said, you know, people should die with dignity. It was a dream of a community, and a community had actually made it happen showed how you can bring together a really diverse group of, of people around any issue and create something that's better than anybody could have done alone and that's maybe better than anybody could have imagined. It didn't take us very long, I think, to fill it once it was built. Uh, there were plenty of people dying of AIDS, uh, probably many more than uh, Bailey Boucher could accommodate in those years. So we had as many as, I think, 600 deaths a year for a while, around 1995, 94, 93. They were losing a person about every 24 to 36 hours. Uh, it was just an amazing rate of death, and people would go in very frail. I mean, one of the sort of horrible things to realize that we had to design in the building was a special exit to take bodies out. It was going to happen so often. There were no effective medications. So our charge during the first years of operation was, was really as a hospice, taking care of people through the end of their life and their loved ones. AIDS Housing of Washington gave people a way to participate in something that they could say, I miss this person. This person meant something to me. Early on, Thomas found a branch and put it in, hung it on the wall upstairs, a sort of ceiling wall, and it became something that we decorated. Small mementos, they were often created by the family of someone who had died, and we, for many years, hung personal mementos of people who had lived and died at Bailey Boucher. There is some good news for people living with AIDS. New drugs decreased the AIDS death rate in the United States last year by 47%. It's no longer among the top 10 causes of death in the United States because people with AIDS... Are in 96, the International AIDS meeting up in Vancouver announced that uh, treatments that consisted of cocktails of multiple drugs targeting the virus in multiple ways uh, seemed to be able to bring the viral replication under control effective medications came to the fore. And not only that, but people's immune systems uh, would spontaneously heal if you could catch them at a good stage and uh, start the medications. The numbers are remarkable. The death rate in 1997 was 5.9 deaths for every 100,000 Americans. It's nearly one-third the rate in 1995, the peak year. The drugs started working and the new cocktails came about and people started taking them. So as far as upstairs was concerned, we couldn't keep the beds filled. You need to fill those beds. If it's empty, you don't get a reimbursement, but your costs stay the same. It evolved into we were taking transplant people. We were taking people from Fred Hutchison. We had a heart transplant folks. And God loved those people who filled those beds because otherwise we wouldn't be here. A big part of Bailey Boucher's mission now is not just caring for people with advanced 
HIV infection, but caring for people whose HIV infection could conceivably be controlled with medications. 85 to 95% of them come in for tune-ups, and we discharge them back home and, and down to day health. They don't come to us to die. And it's also bittersweet, because I think about all the people that I took care of who died, and would they still be here today if we were a little quicker in getting those meds to them? Maybe they would, you know, all those lives that were lost, all those people that are no longer here, and there was a lot of them. I'm a, a client at the Bailey's uh, Adult Day Health program and I've been taking care of this uh, garden. Usually when I come in in the morning, I come out to see what might need done. Uh, this time of year, it's leaves all over the place. Summer, it might something might need watering. I, I work at my own pace. Uh, never, never too hard or too long. Because it's private, and uncomplicated, you know, it's a relaxing place. Uh, I've been out here in a wheelchair and a walker and using a cane or, and uh, can, can keep, on, keep up. Sometimes it gets a little, a little harder, but it's incentive to keep going. The art is meant to be a way to keep Bailey Boucher House from looking or feeling like an institution, to keep it breathing. The art program was actually one of the first pieces of Bailey Boucher House that AIDS Housing in Washington knew they were going to have. They wanted to have art as a way for people to express themselves or just pass the time. Working with artists is a totally Right there working with spiritual caregivers, they report to a different supervisor. Lucky for me, uh, Frank Boucher and Thatcher Bailey were my friends. I had met Thatcher many years before, actually he had met Frank, and we have been lifelong friends. I knew uh, that Thatcher wanted to honor Frank in a particular way, and he didn't want it to be just a plaque. And so somehow it became cleared that a room would be available to honor Frank Boucher. I put a lot of thought into making it a sensuous space because so many people were being denied their sensuality because they were AIDS patients and I just felt that that was an injustice and wanted to address it. It also happens that uh, Frank Boucher was a lively, sexy little guy and it would have been rude to not in some way look at that part of his personality. I think Marianne and Belize did a very good job of, of personalizing the space, but in a, in a quiet way, um, so that those of us who knew and loved Frank understood that there were notes to him underneath the floorboards and a special painting for him behind the blue walls and the, the paintings in front of me, and while making it um, full of images that I think are more universal, can be enjoyed and appreciated by any and all of the residents who use this room to be quiet in or to meet with others or to gather with family. We brought in Frank's family and family members of Thatcher's 
And uh, they paused and gasped, and then one of the sisters said, oh my God, it's perfect. It's a cross between a chapel and a disco. I think that was part of what art could do. It could make it a way to sort of latch on and connect and share some emotion. And the fact that it was embedded all through the building. Did you ever look at the gate to the basement out in the uh, Day Health patio? It's a Steve Jensen piece of work. It's a gorgeous piece of a stainless steel sculpture. But it's the gate to the basement, you know, it's just a small little piece and hidden. Linda Beaumont was the artist that was chosen to do the entrance. You know, she painted that thing by hand. She was doing the concrete on the outside. I think she would have done the parking lot. I really do, except she ran out of time. I didn't really know where I'd go with it, um, but I knew that somehow, instead of it being just um, the rattle of mosaic, that I wanted it to be very continuous and feel almost like a skin. Um, that the walls would be some place that would hold you as you entered in to Bailey Boucher. I just felt that there is something really important about touch, um, both in artworks and both with the sense of where people are in their minds or were with in their minds with AIDS, that it is no touch, no such. And I thought, I want people to touch this wall, these walls. I want them to feel the sensuousness of architecture, even. The wonderful pillar in the lobby. I can't tell you how much time I spent talking to people over the years about all the personal aspects of that column and all the little things that people contributed. And it was such a little talisman. It was sort of like the mezuzah by the door. People came and they could hold on to it. They could see little pieces of something that were someone's life. I've got a button of divine next to a beautiful little Japanese uh, landscape, next to a bottle of an angel wedding ring, a mezuzah that people put in, you know, with their own hands put um, mementos of their loved ones in the wall. And um, there's a baby bracelet of Frank's baby bracelet is in that Thatcher put in. Alright, so we're rolling you guys. Give it a moment and then start. Let's push it in. Yeah. One year. Here we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our music therapist, David, works with people who are interested in music and to use it as a, a way of expressing themselves or as a way of sharing an emotion or just having something that's pleasant to listen to. So for many people, um, it could be just a, a way to pass the time. And then for others, they use it as a tool to explain to family or friends where they are in their life. We've even had some residents who have designed their own end-of-life music that can be playing in the room as they're dying, while others have decided what music will play at their funeral. Sometimes when you look at problems and they're so big, most of us feel overwhelmed by them. You just feel like there's no way to put your arm around it. The truth is, that what happened to Bailey Boucher does not stop unbelievable bad things in this world. The HIV epidemic has proceeded to roll on. In some ways, you can just say, unimpinged by, by everything that we've put in its path. That ignorance and fear continue to be the major enablers in this epidemic. But, you know, the truth is, what has happened in this community is a lot better. 
It isn't the whole picture, but it's a lot better in this community. It was not just the building the building, it was the galvanizing effect of bringing the community together at a fairly early time in the country. This was a particular project in a particular moment in time in a particular community that hit it right on. The sun, the moon, and the stars aligned in this community. And now it's an icon, it's an institution, it's what we are proud of. Nothing changed the course of events more than Bailey Boucher. It altered, literally, the social systems of this community and its humanity. I love this place.